This week's podcast is sponsored by BOTV.com. You might know best of the best as the Dream Car Competition Company who have been giving away cars since 1999. Well now, as well as having a weekly Dream Car winner, they will have a weekly lifestyle competition, giving you the chance to win top-end motorbikes, £10,000 in cash, luxury watches and high-spec gadgets. Some of the cool prizes up for grabs include a 77-inch LG OLED TV, a DJI drone bundle, a £3,500 sauna system and a £4,500 Apple bundle, amongst many others. Get online and give it a go at BOTB.com. Tickets start from just 15 pence and you could be the next weekly winner. Hello and welcome to the Performance Podcast for Monday the 9th of July and joining me on this edition are Steve Withers. Where is my super suit woman? Ed Selly. No capes. And Kaz Harlow. Now I'll tell you what we're not going to do, we're not going to panic. Welcome back to the podcast, this weather continues, it's it's fantastic. Uh, I, I can't remember a summer where we had so many sunny days in a row without masses of rain and thunderstorms. This country and so would be perfect if this was what we could expect yes. every summer, yes. wouldn't it? I, would, I, I don't I, mind um, how cold the winters are. If we could get this every summer, I'd be a very happy man. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, apologies to those listening. Whenever I talk and uh, you can hear traffic in the background or birds singing or whatever, I need to leave the windows open. It's just too darn hot not to have the windows open and a breeze coming through so if it interrupts the podcast I'm sorry about that but um, I need to survive Um, also commiserations to England I'm really sorry to see you going out of the World Cup this weekend that was a shame Uh, but you got further than we thought you would Um, I I haven't got time to edit this so you'll just have to edit this in your head well done England through to the next round of the World Cup Uh, well done on your game on Saturday and uh, into the semis yeah for the first time in 28 years yeah although um be interesting who we're playing as i say the uh the stakes in an england russia game just got a bit higher didn't they yeah if it's great i hope it's croatia for two reasons one i don't fancy playing russia and russia in the semi-final of the world cup and two i suspect croatia would be a more interesting opponent because russia is just going to play i suspect what we'll find out tomorrow evening is that russia will basically defend like mad and hope for a penalty shootout which is what they did against spain <laughs> Well, no, as I said, I said yesterday, get, uh, it's looking more interesting when the ref has to decide between being impartial and never touching his front door with his bare hands ever again. So. <laughs> yeah, there is that. So, uh, yeah, you'll just have to edit that one in your head because I'm editing the podcast today. The game's not till tomorrow. So they're either in or they're out. Um, Shro- Schroding is England. Yeah. <laughs> At this moment in time, we are both. So uh, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, it is anybody's World Cup, though. It really is. No, it's 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 actually when it started, I wasn't watching any of the games. I wasn't I wasn't interested at all. Thought we had no, we wouldn't even get out of our group. Usual story. And gradually over the last couple of weeks, you know, it's become really you know compulsive viewing. I did, fantastic matches and I did predict this. Remember, I did say. I'm sorry. I still think France is going to get it in the end. They are playing some quality football. Yeah, who's the who's the youngster on their team? He's just Kylan uh, Mbappe. Mbappe. He's just good, uh, yeah. astonishing. What I've seen of him, yeah. absolutely. Well, astonishing. No, don't get me wrong. He's exceptionally good. But Mercer, it's not it's not a one person carrying the team job. He is an exceptional yeah. player being backed up and supported by a team that have you know some some what's the strength in depth, and they do all seem to be broadly speaking, playing the same version of football. So, yeah, I, I, I still think they're going to get it. With a bit of luck, um, Suarez will bite his legs off <laughs> today. <laughs> we won't have to face him. Oh, no. I, 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 the, the, I, the, the sheer joy of watching South American sides go out with their legions of weeping spectators. Yeah, that was amazing. really funny. Also, what a bunch of dirty bastards. <laughs> I've never seen a referee have some... I mean, he's just been sending players off left, right and centre in that match. There was some outrageous behaviour on the part of the uh, Colombians. Well, I don't know had the cheek to have a go at us after he handballed his way into the, <laughs> to the World Cup finals in 86. I did. I think towards the end, though, the ref gave up. I quite liked that um, my daughter was watching some of it and uh, and she said, she said, why do the players always fall down and roll on the ground crying? <laughs> and and I, I, couldn't really, <laughs> I couldn't fully explain it to her, but it's quite interesting because at a certain point, the ref just get, kept saying, play on. And I, a couple of the players, when they went down in their usual fall down crying thing, when they saw it was playing on, it was like, get straight up and get back into the game. It's yeah, like watching. It's watching an event where there's higher gravity than anywhere else on earth. 
<laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> either that yeah. or, or there's a sniper in the in the stadium somewhere. The well, there might there might be in the Russian game, so that's not. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, 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 as someone pointed out on Twitter, it's, it's extraordinary that they have as many tattoos as they do, given how low their pain threshold is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when yeah. the Colombians stopped mucking about and actually started playing football, they looked pretty tasty. But you know, for the first half, they were a joke. <laughs> in the second half, they thought, right, we need to uh, get back in this. Uh, and that that photo of uh, Gareth Southgate consoling that Colombian bloke at the end that that yeah. is an iconic image. Yeah. yeah, it's like trust me, mate, I have been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's going to last for years. <laughs> but, but Time like... is not going to heal this wound. <laughs> but like somebody else said, why does Gareth Southgate dress like he's at the last ten minutes of a wedding? No, no, I preferred what's the description? Like. He dresses like an interwar government minister, <laughs> and then they showed him with a photo of him in black and white. It's like that's, that's not a bad call. I like the fact we've got a Sartori elegant, um, young, fit, slim manager managing the team, rather than some fat old bloke in a tracksuit. To mean, be honest, can you? Have- begin to imagine if it had been Sam Allardyce. Sam Allardyce. Oh. <laughs> that was the luckiest thing that's ever happened to this country, wasn't it? <laughs> who was it? Who was, it who was it the sign or who was it? was News of the World, whoever was the one that did the sting operation. Thank you very much for getting a shot of Sam Allardyce. Well, there you go. Don't okay. say fairer than that. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, what can we win competition-wise, Steve? Oh, you mean? You're not above this, but you never <laughs> ever ask me. <laughs> Which is why I've asked you. Oh, bus going past. Uh, there's one prize left, and it's a good one. You can win a 55-inch Q6 QLED TV from Samsung, courtesy of Hughes, and that competition closes on the 30th of July. So you've still got a bit of time there. And there's also the ultimate... You can win the ultimate football bundle from BOTB. Um, that's uh, a thread on the front page, so just go there, have a look, and enter, and you might win the ultimate football bundle, which sounds great. Uh, all competitions are open to eligible av members resident in the UK. Any previous competition winners, Steve? Yes, there are. So, first of all, we have um, Big... <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how it's pronounced. B-I-G, capital D, 1-8-T. So, Big Dibbit? Big Dibbit? Big Dibbit. That's him. Big Dibbit. He's won a copy of Den of Thieves on Blu-ray. Any good, Kaz? I really enjoyed it. It's a knockoff of uh, Heat, but once you get past that fact, it's actually all right. It's Leonidas, you know, Gerard Butler doing his 300 impression in a cop uniform um, chasing criminals. It's it's definitely worth watching, and it's in the post, so he should have it by now. And slightly bigger prize, for the second one. The SVS SB two thousand sub has been won by Mike Mag. So congratulations to Mike. Okay, uh, that's a competition winners. We'll be back in a sec with some hardware news. Okay, so moving on to hardware news, and the uh, first bit we need to talk about is Netflix. Um, they're looking to bump up the price of their subscriptions. Um, they only did this recently, a uh, one pound uh, rise in the subscription. But uh, according to uh, Mark, who does the news, he's been scouting around and found a, a new story in uh, Italy where Netflix have, have a new ultra membership uh, system in place. And it looks like they're trialing this before rolling it out to everybody else. And basically, it means you get a certain number of streams. And if you want HDR, you're going to have to pay a little bit extra. And reading between the lines, it looks like it could cost up to twelve ninety nine for the ultra package if they stick to the pricing model at the minute. So, What is it currently? Uh, I think I Ten. pay I think I pay nine ninety nine at the minute, and that's for yeah, four yeah. streams in HDR and four K. Yeah. So it's basically they're they're trying to sneakily put the prices up without looking like they're putting the prices up. Yeah, and the thing is, like, you're you're not getting anything extra that you don't get at the minute, which is really annoying. You know, if it was a new feature that was coming in, such as when four K came in, they they upped the subscription when that came in. Um, but we've we've got HDR, we've got Dolby Vision at the minute, and it looks like they're they're trying to siphon that off for the next ultra membership tier. So it actually means that you're going to lose out if you're paying nine ninety nine or whatever at the minute, and then this top tier is going to have everything that you get at the minute for nine ninety nine. So the, that means you could have if you have the nine ninety nine tier, um, whatever they call that, the four K tier or something like that, then you'll get four K streaming but no HDR. Yeah. Which presumably, how many TV, how many 4K TVs are they knocking around that don't do HDR these days? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It'd, Not many. <laughs> it'd be nice if they just turned around and said, "Look, we've got all this content. We want to do more. We're going to have to up the pricing." 
rather than trying to, to, to do it. And I mean, we're just assuming that this is going to roll out as well. So there's nothing in stone that says that this is going to roll out. It could just be a thing for the Italians and they could just be getting hit with this. And it, it But it looks like they're trialling it in one area and then they'll, they'll spread it out elsewhere. It's not going to put me off pain because I think even at twelve ninety nine, and I, I, I don't it's want to say it's, good value. it's it's excellent value, especially when you look at the likes of Sky and everything else that you have to have to get to get similar levels of of content. And they are knocking out the park when it comes to TV series stuff. And um, the only other ones that can keep up with that is uh, is HBO. And you know, I, I can't think of anybody else. I mean, Amazon have have just seem to have fallen by the wayside when it comes to their own content. So. Yeah, I, I'm still happy to pay for that because it is good quality. Amazon should get a little bit more interesting when the Jack Ryan series comes along because I'm quite looking forward to that. And obviously they've got the Lord of the Rings stuff and they've got a couple of shows they've brought in recently. Well, they've got Preacher, which is back, which I like, and a Marvel series, um, Cloak and Dagger. But, um, yeah, most of my streaming viewing does seem to go in the direction of Netflix. Um, so in the middle of what, in the middle of the moment, Luke Cage, another Marvel series. <laughs> so many Marvel series. I think Netflix definitely has the edge. I, I, I also don't like the uh, Amazon interface. I find True. it horrendous. Amazon interface is shocking. You know, it's I, awful. I, I can't remember the last time it made it easy to find any 4K content. Um, it, it, you can do searches for 4K, search for Ultra HD, and it never comes up. Uh, but if I search my viewing history, I can see like I watched Man in a High Castle in Ultra HD. Um, that's great. Why can't I find like season two in Ultra HD? What, why mm. do they? Why make it hard? Um, so I think I think their interface is actually off-putting because you stick on Netflix and uh, it's um, it's very you know it's very very easy interface to see what's going on, what's come up, you know, what's the latest thing. I don't get why Amazon don't do something about it. Yeah, it's like they're almost willfully trying to stop you from watching stuff in the highest possible quality. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the amount of people, tons of people on the forums going like, my TV doesn't do HDR on Amazon. And I think, yeah, it does. You just have to go and find it on Amazon. Yeah, but that's actually HDR. really hard. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I gave up with Goliath and watched it in um, in normal because I couldn't. I got I got thirty megabits per second streaming, and and I can't find Goliath in four K on um, on Amazon. Yeah, it's a weird one that weird one. But Netflix is great. I, I mean, I still think, yeah, like Phil said, even at 12 9 I think it would be good value. You're getting a cracking product, and it's being delivered in the highest possible quality. Um, and they're pushing the technological envelope quite a bit in terms of uh, their service. And they, they've been the ones that have really been at the cutting edge of late. And, uh, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy with I, – I mean, I, I, I think – I'd rather they were just up front and said, look, we need more money to pay for all these shows. We're going to put the subscription up rather than try and do it in a sneaky kind of roundabout backdoor kind of way. But um, ultimately, I think, you know, it, we're getting the quality products, particularly in terms of series, um, that we want. So, yeah, I'm happy with it. Yeah, def- I definitely agree. I think it's it's well worth it. Um, I think the trouble with telling people the truth is it doesn't always work. But like when Wiki gives you that message saying, you know, in order to keep being free we need you to give us some money uh, you know that i think that uh, if netflix were up front and said look we need to we want to keep providing you with good content um we need to ch- charge an increase i mean I, I just don't think everyone would necessarily respond to that well it, it, you read it on the forums and it's the usual um you know some people saying well you know, it's good quality and all the rest of it if that's uh, if that's the case but you'll always get people who say oh that's it i'm gonna i'm gonna cancel my subscription yeah. Or even sneakier is the one where they go, I subscribe for a month, binge watch the buggery out of everything on it for a month, and then <laughs> stop the prescri- subscription for another month or two, and then when something else comes along, then do it for a month and binge watch like mad. So yeah. that's a bit sneaky. <laughs> but, but at least, no, you see, I think that's part of their business plan, though, Netflix. Yeah. That, that's always been part of the plan is that don't tie people in, let them let them have the freedom to come and go. Um, and, and a lot of the cases, that's what they rely on. They'll, they'll rely on people coming back and then just sticking with it after after doing it a few times. Yeah, they, they use the, the, the gym membership model, isn't it, where you, you kind of start a, a subscription and then you don't ever get around to cancelling it. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. though you never go to the gym yeah. after the first two weeks. And and the thing is, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't charge people for it, but I know people do do this where they'll get a couple of mates together and they'll each put a certain bit, a bit in every month and because you can have up to four people on your account, um, they share it amongst friends. You know, that's... Yeah. And Netflix don't 
don't worry about that. You know, they're not bothered about that. So, um, so you know, they, they've thought about this. They've looked at it and they've looked at how people are using their service. And, um, you know, if that had been Sky, Sky would have been stopping that straight away. You know what I mean? Well, they do, don't they? Yeah. I mean, you can't uh, change your account more than once a month and add a new device. Um, on, on the Now TV, yeah. On the Now so, TV app, yeah. 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 Um, so they're already kind of trying to stop people from doing those kind of things. I mean, you can still do it, but you just you're limited in how much you can do uh, every month. But uh, and yeah, and yeah, no, and, and now TV still isn't. Is it not 1080p yet? It's still not 1080p yet, is it? It's still no, it's not, not well not behind yet. the curve. Yeah, yeah. I had to wait a month to get it on the new TV. I was really annoyed with That's now TV. So annoying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm, it, it just happens that I got new phones, two new phones, and a new TV in the same month, and it's like, no, you can't change it. You have to wait a month. Content's going off there. You can see the content's going off. It won't play it. And I'm paying them every month. It's not like I'm watching it on something, you know, my old broken phone. So yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's a bit sneaky. Actually. Yeah. So I, I mean, kudos like could, to Netflix for for you know the model that they have adopted because it works and, and it keeps people there and it keeps subscriptions coming in. And um, all right, you know, this ultra membership, if it comes in, I know it's going to annoy a few people. But to be honest with you, I still think it's amazing value for money. Uh, getting four K and HDR content. So and. Personally, I don't see it as an issue, but I can understand those that do. So, um, anyway, moving on. Um, so, how are you getting on with the the B7 LG TV that you've got in now? I, this is becoming the B7 podcast now. <laughs> oh yeah, everyone's got one, haven't they? Apart from you, Phil. <laughs> yeah, I've got, got C8. I've got, I've got C8. C8. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great telly. I've got I've got used to its idiosyncrasies, I think, and uh, it's it's great looking. I, I'm still coming around to. Dolby Vision, I think, because um, it, I mean it is a spectacular picture. But uh, I got a spectacular picture out of the Samsung before, and uh, it's only, I think it's only around the edges which I I notice a bit of the Dolby Vision coming in, um, which maybe isn't the upgrade that, for example, people saw when HDR improved the simple kind of pixel upgrade of 4K. Yeah, um, I. I... I said this last week, and and I'll continue to say it, and putting screens side by side and so on. The the differences are so subtle between Dolby Vision and HDR10, really, really subtle. That the people banging on saying it has to have Dolby Vision and all the rest of it. Yeah, fair enough. If you want your TV to have that, then then that's great. But in terms of performance, it's not the be all and end all. No, it it, it is it is a um, so it's subtle improvement in picture quality, and you've got to go looking for it to a certain extent. So it's not a night and day thing. Um, I think it's nice to have. But yeah, the picture quality you're going to get from HDR10 is still spectacular. So, you know, don't don't panic if you don't have Dolby Vision or if you don't have a player or whatever. You know, it's not it's not the end of the world. Yeah. So, um, like Steve says, I've got the C8 in at the minute. I've got an EF8 at the minute as well. So I've got two uh, of the the big OLED TVs for the year, and I've also just sent back. Although I didn't video it and I didn't do it to jazz, but um, it, <laughs> it, it, it was it was an effort to pack up the 65 inch FZ 952. So I've had those three OLED TVs. The, these are the, going to be the main OLED TVs for the year. And Steve's asked me in the running order to choose my favourite one. Um, that's really really difficult. <laughs> it's Sophie's choice. <laughs> it is really really difficult. Um, if you were using it just as a monitor to plug your sources in and all the rest of it, then the Sony does an ex- excellent job. Motion-wise, Sony's superb. I love the uh, gradation stuff on there as well. Um, their picture processing is the best at the minute. It's not by a huge margin, but it is the best at the minute in terms of picture processing and motion. But their user interface, and I'll keep banging on about this, but it is a mess, It's basically. not fit for purpose, so and, we um, so bang on about it. <laughs> it seems it seems like we're talking about this every week, um, but obviously it's an issue if we're talking about it every week. So that in itself would stop me if it was my money and I was going out to the shop to buy an OLED TV, I would rule out the F8, not because of the picture quality and its picture processing and so on, but just because of the user interface and the fact that it uses Android and it's slow and buggy. Um, and I didn't ha- I haven't had any crashes yet. But I know people have, so you know it's not a very stable system. So then it leaves the C8 and the F F Z nine five two. As an all rounder, the C8 is really really good. I mean, really good. But one bit that I don't get on with with the C8 is the way that the Freeview Play works, and I find it so much more intuitive using the F Z nine five two, the Panasonic. 
just because I could use the up and down arrow keys in the directional pad to get the now and next banner to pop up. So I didn't have to leave the channel I was watching to a full screen to go through the banners to see what what's on on other channels and then pressing OK to select that. Whereas with the C8, you either scroll wheel through, which means you do leave the channel to go and see what, what's on elsewhere, or you have to go into that guide, which shrinks the image way down that you're watching, and then have to scroll through a guide. I don't like that approach. But that's the only negative I can find on the C8, to be honest with you. Um, so we're picking hairs a bit here. So, so we really are. You really are picking hairs a bit. Um, that's the only it's thing. It's interesting because I, I, don't don't like. I don't have anything to compare the LG's TV guide to because I've gone from using Sky for 13 years to turning this on for the first time to connect to an aerial and I did I, I have found myself very much going this is a bit shit uh, but mm. with no real point of comparison I don't know if they're, I didn't know if they're they're all like that or I, I mean i do know that um it's a ridiculous thing to uh to you know in terms of the, the cost benefit but you do realize that sky's guide is pretty excellent but it's the actually. same it's the same on the panasonic so that so if you're used to using the sky guide and you're used to using the um if you've got a bt box or whatever and you're used to using yeah. that approach to to the guides then the panasonic's the same as that so that's why i find that more intuitive to use than the c8 because the c8 you either have to bring up the free view play um, guide and have the, the image shrunk down or you you basically have to flick through the channels and actually change channels um, to see what's... But again, we're picking it here. But but for me, that that was that is a downside on the C8. Um, if they change that one thing, I think it would be the, almost the perfect TV for <laughs> me. For me, and I've got to make this clear, it would be the almost perfect TV. And the Panasonic, I absolutely adore the Panasonic picture quality. There's not a huge deal in it um, when it comes to the C8 to the to the 952, and in fact, I would say that the C8 is slightly brighter when it comes to HDR stuff. Although the Panasonic does tend to to um, push a little bit of brightness in the mid tones with HDR stuff, but I find it I don't know what it is um, about the Panasonic image, but I just really like the Panasonic image. I like the colours. And, and I have a preference towards that more than the C8. Although I will say that with HDR stuff, um, there is a little bit of black crush with the Panasonic. And even using the new 12 point white balance, which has a 5 IRE and a 2.5 IRE, you can't correct it. Well, you can, but then it, it, it brightens the whole image then. It mm. changes the gamma. So that's the only little thing on the Panasonic is this, there, there is a little bit of black crush, but you'd only notice it if you're watching side by side material if if you're not watching side by side material you don't even know it's there and the image quality is fantastic and the, you know there's a reason why a lot of these production facilities use the panasonic um with its 3d lookup tables and i've got to say the new dynamic lookup table the way that, that it works um i didn't see any issues with that either so that works really well and, and i've just got to say just color wise whereas the ch got a really excellent image quality and, and again we're talking about you know tiny incremental differences but for me i think the colors are just a little bit pushed on the c8 even though they measure particularly well to the eye and you know this is what counts what's actually on the screen not what's in the graphs um the colors a little bit pushed on the c8 to the eye compared to the i'd say a, a bit more natural looking on the panasonic i don't know if you're going to agree with this steve or not but that's definitely my my takeaway from this and again we're talking about tiny tiny little differences in image quality here yeah no I, I i totally agree i think the picture on the on the panasonic is stunning uh, and for pure image quality uh, aside from as you said phil a, a, a tiny amount of black crush I, i'd have to give it, give it and it, like you say I, it's just edging it slightly but i'd just slightly give the image quality to the to the um uh, panasonic i think there's an overall package i still think the c8 is the best option um you know, as an overall TV package, pitch quality, features, interface, etc., design, sound. When you add it all together, I think it's the better TV. But, uh, but I'd say on pure pitch quality terms, yeah, you're right. The, 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 the Panasonic does deliver an absolutely gorgeous image. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, and and if you can get a 65 inch in that, cool. It's <laughs> it is mm. a really really nice screen. But yeah, there's I, a 77 I, as well, isn't there? There is, yes. For the for the person that needs for um, which which model are we talking about? 
C-A-C-Series. C-A-C-Series. Yeah, yeah. 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 A, fact, a, fact, a friend of mine, he had a an A1, and he loved it, absolutely loved it. Apart from, he wasn't a big fan of Android, like no, I don't think anyone is, but he generally, picture quality-wise, and as you said, Phil, motion handling-wise, he watched a lot of football, he plays a lot of games, he loved the A1, absolutely loved it, and then they introduced that software update, so it started dimming when he was watching football and playing games, and it just became unusable for him, so he bought the Q9, didn't get on with the Q9. Um, I did tell him to get C8 originally, but he, he got the Q9 because he didn't want to spend you know, eight grand on a 77-inch um, Q- C8. But eventually he decided, yeah, he went went for the C8 and he got the C8 last week and he just said, look, it's the best TV I've ever had. He said, I am so happy. I finally think I found the perfect TV for me. So he's a very happy camper with the yeah, 77-inch yeah. C8. But uh, yeah, I've got to say, when it comes to those three TVs in particular, there's not a great deal between them. Um, obviously the Sony is a little bit handicapped with its with its operating system, but if you can get around that, it's still a great TV. Um, and a lot of people on the forums do on the AF8 and, and do get around that or find that, that the operating system is, is not annoying to them for use. So, yeah, it's horses for courses, basically, and, and you can't go wrong with any of the three. Um, but if I was to be asked the one that I'd actually go and spend my hard-earned cash on, I'd go and buy the Panasonic. <laughs> personally, you- personally, I would go and buy the Panasonic. Okay. Well, that's, you know, it's your money. Well, it's not your money. Um, <laughs> it's, it's your hypothetical money, and go go you. Uh, yeah. th- this is the thing. I mean, we're ultimately, um, we are dealing with shades of, that they're all turning out and outstandingly accurate performance. It's just going to come down to, in part, there'll be a degree of historical preference um, based on how certain brands have gone about doing certain things. And yeah, then, then just fine details more than anything else. Yeah, and that's that's just because I get on with the Panasonic more than I get on with the C8. The C8 is still an absolutely cracking I mean, TV. It, it, I, I can see where you're coming from. After three Panasonic plasmas, it would have been, I think I would have been at my happiest just then going into the world of Panasonic OLED. But the pricing was such that that just wasn't going to fly. I'm delighted yeah. with the LG, even in the circumstances which I'm currently using it. But nonetheless, I, I can see where you're coming from. It would have been a, just an innate familiarity in terms of how it operates and how it looks that yeah. would have had me going, yeah, yeah. that's that's And, that's, and that's, that's, right. that's the only reason why I, w- I would go and, and pay my own money for, for that TV. Um, as it is, I'm, I'm living with a C8 at the minute. I've got the EF8 there, which is running in the background, but it's in another room at the minute being used for that. The actual living room TV is the C8, and it's just there's just this little annoyance <laughs> flicking through TV channels. It doesn't quite fit with the way I like to do it. But that's you that's, use a TV up. Um, oh yeah, I could, I could, boxing. yeah, of course I could, I could do that, and then it would solve the issue. Um, and I'm not, and I'm not saying it's a major issue at all. It's not. This is, this is just when it comes down to, like you say, like like we did last year, Steve. We had four of these TVs calibrated within an inch of their mm-hmm. life and not one of them looked better than the other <laughs> they all looked more or less bang on the same there were sl- some subtle differences but yeah. you really had to go looking for the subtle differences and and this is what we're talking about here if, if i lined all three of these up and calibrated them to within an inch of their life and covered up what they were and they were all the same screen size i doubt you'd be able to pick which one was the lg which one was the panasonic and which one was the was the Sony just on image quality? It would be a really, really difficult ask for you to be able to do that. That's how close these things are. So I don't want people thinking that we're um, talking about any major negatives here. We're not. This is this is absolute nitpicking of the <laughs> of the eighth degree. It really is. It's don't worry about it. <laughs> buy any of them. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, pick the one you th- you like. Basically, go and have a look at them in the shop. Choose the one you like. Um, you know, maybe it's design wise or picture wise or feature wise, whatever the thing that's most important to you. Just use that as your basis. And ob- obviously, price is always a factor too. The uh, Panasonics are very competitively priced, has to be said. Yeah, they are at the minute. So, yeah, any- anything between those three. And again, we're long term testing two of those uh, in the 55 inch range um, for the rest of the year. And I'm hoping at some point we'll get the Panasonic in as well, the 802, um, just to add that to the mix. And I'm looking at possibly a Q9FN turning up soon as well to add to that. We'll have a few of these on long-term test for the year and we'll keep coming back and updating it. It could be that I completely change my mind by the end of the year. We'll we'll have to wait and see. But I don't think you can go wrong with any of those three TVs. Right, so moving on to Steve, who's not been looking at TVs recently. He's been listening to um, some speakers 
Yeah, um, this is the Darts Theatre. That's Darts, small d, capital A, capital R, capital T, capital S. Theatre 535 Custom Box. Uh, you can have this system, which is a 7.2 channel system, for you, your sir, for a very reasonable £24,000. Um, but, I know that's a lot of money. I, I absolutely understand that. But it does sound absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> better, better for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, very, very, what I love about this system is that the company that provided it for review, uh, Genesis Technologies, they, um, uh, they provided everything. So it came with speakers, obviously. And it, this, this is a system. So it's, it's actually a set of speakers, seven channels, two subs, and also uh, a DSP amp. Uh, so that, that's all the system. But they also provided speaker stands, all the cabling, and the, the ACT4, which I mentioned last week, that, that's there as, as the processor for the system and all the cabling for that too. So that was very nice of them. It saved me a lot of hassle and work. Um, and this system is incredible because what the basic system is, is it's, like I said, it's a 7.2 channel system. So you've got seven channels, front, left and right, center, two sides, two rears, and two um, active powered subwoofers. And the amplifier is a 16 channel amp but what the way it works is that they actually um calibrate the amp and the sp- and the speakers and the, by speakers i mean the individual drivers in an anechoic chamber at the factory so each system is calibrated specifically for each driver for each uh, for amplification for each driver so you actually buy you're by, basically by amping in the case of center speaker triamping um this system so it's all calibrated using dsp in the factory so it, Every speaker. So you have to when you're setting up, you have to make sure you're connecting the right output to the right speaker because it is actually calibrated for that speaker and for the specific drivers in that speaker, um, giving you uh, an incredibly precise and accurate sound system. So that's that's one of the reasons why it's a bit pricey, I suspect. So the uh, the amplifier it has eight XLR inputs. It's also got RCA inputs as well. So I connected it via the ACT using the, uh, the XLR input outputs on that into the amplifier. Wired up all the speakers. Uh, you got the two dual 10 inch powered subs. They're 500 watts each, and then the the amp is 250 watts per each of the 16 channels. Now, I have to say, pleasingly, it didn't weigh an absolute ton for once. It was relatively light for an amplifier with that many channels built into it, as opposed to, say, the Amplitude M from Trinov that I was using with the uh, with the Altitude 16, which weighed, weighed as much as a neutron star. Um, so, yeah, you wire it all up and then um, use um, uh, Odyssey Multi-X, Multi, Multi-Q XT32 Pro to calibrate the amplifier so really the act4 in this situation wasn't doing any processing it was basically just providing acting as a preamp and providing all the sources because the calibration is done within the amplifier itself and really with all the speakers already perfectly married to the amp what you're basically doing is just uh, you know evening out the bass in the room a little bit of tweaking here and there but the results were absolutely spectacular basically the idea behind it is you just eliminate the the impact of the room entirely tonally perfectly balanced system where sounds gets steered around the room with, with unbelievable level of precision and it really does sound amazing i was uh i was i was gobsmacked at how good this sounded and, and how relatively easy it was to set up actually once i followed the instructions and made sure i kept all the you know the right drivers to the right outputs um yes 24 grand is a lot of money i'm not saying it isn't um but it's nice to see that you can get a level of performance commensurate with the amount of money you've just spent in terms of a really really seamless three-dimensional sound field um uh, that, that delivered deep solid bass uh beautiful really responsive fast response um and you know just uh a cracking system and and i've got to say over the last couple of weeks i have been somewhat spoilt on the audio side of things um and even though i'm using an r cam going back sometimes can be a bit you know like well, it's not quite as good as it was before uh <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, i've got to say this is i've never heard of darts before i have to say darts theater it's uh, like us um but um but the, 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 obviously this is a high-end custom install system let's be honest about it but um uh, yeah, in terms of uh, delivering what it promises, uh, it totally seems incredibly accurate sound stage that de- eliminates the impact of the room and just delivers the sound in the best possible quality. It really does deliver, and uh, and I think an interesting approach to uh, to obviously an expensive approach, but an interesting approach to delivering sound in a home theatre. Um, uh, and and these are it's pretty powerful too. I mean, my, my room isn't that big, but you could use it in a much bigger room. Um, and there are options also if you're interested in more immersive audio. There are also options. Just to add ask additional amp- yes, you can add additional amplification and run uh, overheads as well. Um, obviously, you need a, a, se- a second amplifier to do that. 
but they do make seeding speakers and this sort of stuff for for that very purpose that can be you know uh, calibrated with the with the amplifier for the drivers and everything else so you, you can create a full i guess depends on your processor but theoretically 9.2.6 uh, i guess um you could do that with uh, with with this system and uh yeah i mean i, mean, I should imagine the results then would be absolutely mega <laughs> How did you fit all this into your cinema room? It wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't too bad, actually, because it came with stands. So I just had to basically replace what was already there <laughs> with the speakers that were um, that, that, that they sent over. And they aren't actually that big. They're, they're, they're not gigantic. I mean, there are no floor standards involved here, which is always a nice. That makes it slightly easier when you haven't got to deal with floor standards. Um, so they're, they're well-made speakers, and they're, and they're pretty heavy. But they aren't huge. They're not as big as, say, the Arundels, which are, are massive and weighed a ton. Um, so actually installing it was, was relatively straightforward. And like I said, because it came with everything, it made my life a lot easier. <laughs> so, so this is definitely a subsat system then? Yes, it is. Um, I mean, I, we say subsat, obviously, I mean... They are still quite large speakers. I mean, they're not like you know, we're not talking tiny little legs here or something like that. But yes, it's very much a sat sub, sub, a sub sat system, and the two subs are specifically chosen and developed and designed to integrate with the front left and right specifically. So you want to position them relatively close to that front and left and right speakers because they're designed to work in conjunction with them, um, which basically means that they also sound great with music. What was the crossover used, Steve? I used uh, eighty hertz. Right. Okay. Good stuff. So this. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it is Odyssey. I mean, I know Odyssey is not necessarily the best. Um, I would have to say, in my opinion, Odyssey is not the best um, room EQ system there is. I think there are better ones available. I've, I've got to say, though, that the, the subwoofer side of things has improved drastically. Yes. And um, I like the fact that you can select. Um, um, Odyssey does give you a little bit more freedom in terms of if you want to switch the, sub, the, the crossovers from t for different speakers, you can do that. But obviously, yeah. these are designed. Been, been calibrated in the in the in the factory anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, really, you're using Odyssey just to tweak it, uh, just to tweak it for the room a little bit, and just to even out the bass a little bit. Um, but but a lot of it's been done for you in the factory. So so um, so, did you have to up your insurance this this last couple of months, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The house? I could have to go. I mean, honestly, I think it's worth more than the house. <laughs> some, of the, <laughs> some of the stuff in here. <laughs> I know Ed's thinking twenty four grand. That's a new Fiesta ST three. Well, yeah, I mean, but it's horses for courses, isn't it? Um, you know, you can enjoy the uh, the speakers responsibly when drunk, for example. So they've got that going for them. <laughs> um, it, look, it, ultimately, uh, these things are cyclical. Uh, I'm glad that we are looking at some of these products. And, you know, your reminder that if you suddenly want to become uh, all, you know, up the workers about this, that firstly, uh, with certain companies – the existence of these products in their ranges subsidizes the more day-to-day -day stuff that we actually look at buying. They act as technology demonstrators for the stuff that we end up buying. And, um, you know, ultimately, at the time, uh, we're recording this on the Friday, it's a £49 million Euro millions win uh, this evening for some lucky sod somewhere in the EU. And frankly, under those circumstances, you know, the, there's there there are a subset of people for whom they're not worried about where their uh, next twenty four thousand pounds are coming from. They just, you know, and the, the, these products exi exist for that requirement. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, this this is part of the AV side uh, of the world that that not a lot of people get access to, and not a lot of people see. And uh, I have in the past been to some of these uh, homes, houses, and. Um, been absolutely blown away by brands I've never heard of, Steve, because there's a lot of brands <laughs> yeah, yeah. That you, you haven't heard of, but been blown away by just what is possible if money is no object and if you're designing a, a home theatre in, in a luxury home like that, what you can achieve is is pretty astonishing. I mean, even IMAX have moved into this market now and, mm -hmm. and for a cool million pounds, you, you can have their, their entry level IMAX system in your home. Um, and it goes into several millions if you want to have the the big thing. So yeah, there's a whole other side to this this industry that we just don't see on a day to day basis. But um, I, I've had my glimpses. I know Steve's been along a few of these things as well. And and when you do get to see them and hear them, it's astonishing what is capable um, and and what you can have in the home. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you've got the money, and let's be honest, if I won that 59 million quid on Friday tonight, I would uh, I would be building a a 
seriously expensive home cinema with that cash. Uh, well, obviously, I'll do other things with it too, but the home cinema, and you know, you get in a professional, you get a dedicated room, you have it properly, you know, treated from beginning to end, all perfectly designed out before you even start with the equipment. Um, you, you know, and if you've got the space to have lots of seating and stuff and to build something that is genuinely a cinema. I, I think that the, when you sit in those kind of t- custom rooms that are basically just small cinemas, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience because it really just makes you feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm in my own movie theatre and, and <laughs> I haven't got to mix with the hoi polloi any longer, which is great. <laughs> right up your street. Eh? I think uh, that 40, is it 49 million, did you say, Ed? 49 million? Yes, tonight, 59? 49 million. I'd, 49 I'd spend million. at least okay, 20 of that on the house and I would design the house around the theatre and the garage. So the basement would be the theatre and the garage. Um, That's like but, Tony Stark's house. And there would be, <laughs> uh, yeah, and there'd be a glass window between the two so you could sit and look at your classic cars um, or switch a button and it goes completely black and you've got a theatre room where you can sit and watch whatever. And then I don't care what the rest of the house is. I probably wouldn't have it quite like that if I'm honest there's actually a nice place for so it's unusual you just have an a, 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 a empty room with two speakers and a hi-fi system and a, and a chair <laughs> no, 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 that'd, no, be, that'd be it wouldn't it <laughs> here's the thing again you know I also have you know had had a couple of glimpses over the years into into the ve- the very high end um, I was at a dealer uh, la- late last month doing a piece for a magazine uh, they played a couple of systems the last system they played was £206,000 all up um, that includes all of your cabling so it's not all bad um, and the thing is that that it actually it, in terms of some of the brands involved it wouldn't necessarily have been my, my first choice where I was spending that much money but what I thought was notable is that you could get that working in a large UK lounge that's why they they did they demonstrated you know that that sort of the thing in comparison to the dedicated requirements of building a truly world-class piece uh, multi-channel um, environment actually I'm just looking for a large solid well upholstered room for, for what I need I don't I don't actually want to build property around it I you know I've, I've played about with enough of it that I can build the equipment I can sort the equipment to fit the property and then I'd also having thought about these things relatively speaking I'd also probably deliberately limit the amount of space that there was for the storage of cars to prevent myself myself from buying every car <laughs> it's a, it's about knowing knowing your own limitations I would have an I would spend an unreasonable sum of money on the kitchen no I don't I don't have a problem admitting that it would be you know there, there, there are certain bits and bobs that I have played with over the years it's like do you know what I, I could do with one of those yeah, in my I'd, life I'd do the same but it'd be the specification of the cook that I hired to, <laughs> to cook yeah, yeah. It'd be, <laughs> oh, in my no. case Laura's specifications for the kitchen you can do what you like in there <laughs> Long as there's 20 acres around the house, electrified fences and attack dogs. That's the main thing for me, just to keep Obviously, everyone away. I, I, you know, as, as it stands, I, I would the, the be living in the place pretty much on my on my own with with, with visits visits from boys. So that I, I'd have to uh, actually pay attention to things like that. And the idea, I, I don't know, you, you, it, clearly you, you might feel differently about this, but it, it becomes a bit, a bit Bruce Wayne, but not in a good way. If it's just you rattling around a giant place with some ancient manservant looking after you that's not really appealing i mean i know these are problems that i'm not necessarily going to face in reality but no i i, I you know where, whereas i probably have the services of a cleaner from time to time I, I otherwise wouldn't wouldn't have lots of people running around after me <laughs> i don't like the idea of that very much kaz what would you spend 50 million on i think that if i had 15 million i would definitely 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 million i'd I would definitely consider uh, Tony Starking it, but I mean, there's lots of other things that. Well, an Iron Man suit. <laughs> not yeah, quite. Not quite. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Just skip the rest and go for an Iron Man suit. Can no. we be clear about this whole Tony Starking bit? Tony Stark's notional house on the California coastline works because it's a notional house on the California coastline. If you built the same thing in Durham, I need to be very clear about this. <laughs> it would look shit. I didn't. I didn't say I was going to have a st- Tony Stark house. Steve suggested that. Yeah. What I suggested was that at least the ground floor would be a garage and a theatre room, and I'd be able to sit in one and look at my lovely cars. That would be the only thing that I would spec. The rest of the house would be pretty normal, to be honest. I, I have to say, Steve, Steve built a Tony house 
Stony Stark House in, in Dorset, they, they'd burn him. <laughs> I'm, I'm, also, I'm also quite sensible, so I think I'd probably just invest it and live <laughs> off the interest. And if the interest amounted to enough to uh, maybe do some work and, and get a nicer house and normal things, then I'd probably go with that rather than if blow... You're investing it wrong. Can I be very clear about this? A, 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 for, let's let's say for the sake of argument that you were nice to friends and family, so you ended up with an, a net forty million. Uh, you could uh, invested even ultra prudently. Treasury that bills would, <laughs> that would still be pretty pretty much uh, uh, allow you to be profligate is the wrong word, but you could live a entirely contented life without ne- ever actually affecting the the, the, the capital involved in that yeah so that i think that's what i do rather than spend millions on like an imax setup which sounds amazing uh so so i'd probably build up to that so then from whatever net I can't profit you're, getting, you're getting, do they're giving you 50 million and you're building up to something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're taking, like, life's too short cad spend some of the money and yeah, invest no, the rest but i'm not sure i'd spend 10 million on an av setup well i'm not saying i'd spend 10 million on an av system i'd buy a house for 10 million of which part of that would be a balls out, no mucking about home cinema. Yes, I Where definitely I have there, a. Balls out. a high... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just like it. Yeah, yeah. You, sit, you, you can, you, you can, you can't buy class, can you, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Leave the plastic covering on those seats. <laughs> God. Oh dear me! I've seen season two of Goliath too recently to hear you talk like this. I've never seen Goliath. Is it any good? You should watch it, yeah. It's anything with Billy Bob Thornton is worth watching, and Goliath is really good, really good. It's it's just getting Billy Bob Thornton drunk and swearing a lot as a lawyer. It's it 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 works. He's he's he, no one can restrain him, and he's uh, he's a lot of fun. Good, well, excellent, right? So, and are we going to get back to some hardware then? Um, uh, I suppose. And, Ed, you're going to have to be quick with this. The the yeah. cutest dark. You've already spoken quite some length about this back uh, CES, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so you've now we had finally it. got around to reviewing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will be as short and as sweet as you like. When you guys review televisions, you have the luxury of being able to say how close they got to uh, a, a an agreed standard. Of, of you know broadcast quality which is even when dealing with measurements in two channel it's not it's never as simple as that what i would summarize on that is that if you want to choose your audio equipment where you are you, you are seeking to achieve the closest you can to a notional ideal of accuracy this is one of the most affordable products in any category that can do that genuinely you know, it, you will sit. It, the the performance that it offers is exactly what is on the recording itself. No embellishments, no messing about, no nothing. Um, some people, you know, there's a degree of subjectivity in what we in what we do in two channel. For some people, that won't be what they're looking for. But I, in an absolute sense, it is. Uh, you know, it is it is a ba- you know it is a a baby reference point of equipment. It ha- doesn't have a reference badge. You can read the review and we'll cover all of that. But nonetheless, it is absolutely outstanding at what it does. So that's as short and as sweet as I can make it. Presumably, so, so I've coincided I, with the bus. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to tell us. <laughs> you're going to tell us where it is. Ah, oh, do I have to? Yeah, all right. It's a it's a DAC. It's a digital to analog converter. It's from Cord Electronics. Um, for those of you who actually pay attention uh, you know have, have, have decent memories and so on and so forth i reviewed the hugo 2 uh last year the cutest takes the decoding of the hugo 2 makes some other detailed changes to it but it removes the volume control the headphone amp the battery and the portability so it's more affordable and it's set up specifically for use as part of your home system not as something you can take out and about with you which simplifies it um it for fo- it follows on cords continuing plan to be a bit less weird so they've done things like label the inputs and outputs you know which is a, a big deal for them uh so you've got a product which is very small easy to live with it's built like a lorry and as i say it, it the, what what comes out the end of it is pretty much uh, and you know there are, there is no embellishment no 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 margin of error to it it is an, an exceptional piece of 
you know tra- tra- you know in terms of transparency it does it, it does things that were pretty much impossible at any price i guess 15 years ago so yeah uh the review's coming out enjoy yourselves and uh it, it i i you know I, I if you're shopping at that price point realistically unless you are looking for coloration it? it's uh 1200 quid uh, unless you are looking for to induce coloration that's about as good as it gets okay well, I, I don't think we're going to be any more on point than that. So uh, that's it for Hardware News this week. We'll be back with movie news and reviews in a sec without the reviews. Okay, so, um, yeah, like I say, without the reviews because um, there's still not a hell of a lot to go and see. But that's going to change this week, isn't it, Steve? Isn't it? Yes, Skyscraper and... Is out. So hang on, that's yeah. So film's opening this Friday. Actually, no, sorry. Film's opening on Thursday, Skyscraper, and on Friday, The Incredibles 2. So this big week this week, we've got Skyscraper, which is the new film starring The Rock, uh, as a security expert with one leg who is uh, overseeing, uh, or uh, I think interviewing for a job um, in a new, a new skyscraper built in Hong Kong. Uh, and he's there interviewing for it, and then um, it gets taken over by some, I don't know, the terrorists or villains or whatever, but uh, yes, he's basically, it's basically Die Hard, Die Hard, and the Towering Inferno with The Rock. And to be honest, that sounds awesome, so I'm up for uh, that. You forget, you're good. forgetting The Rock with one leg. That's the big said, selling yeah, point here. One leg, yeah, one-legged yeah. Uh, security expert. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, you know, it is what it is, and uh, having seen many of The Rock's films, I suspect it will be well-made, and hugely entertaining, and that's what more could you want out of two hours at the cinema? So for me, that's I'm definitely going to go and see Skyscraper, and I'm also going to go, and, and I'm also going to go and see The Incredibles 2, uh, which has done gangbusters in the states, uh, and it's been very well received, and I enjoyed The Incredibles so, and it's been well, how long has it been since Incredibles 2002, wasn't it? 2004, so 14 years, blimey. Um, yeah, long overdue sequel, uh, again written directed by Brad Bird, and um, yes, yeah, so two two cracking movies opening this week after what has been let's be honest a fairly quiet a few weeks so um yeah I'm up for that. gotta blame the world cup for that one right uh so i think i'll go for the 515 showing on that on the thursday so we'll talk about this uh next week on the podcast skyscraper you're gonna go and see it on the thursday night steve i i'm hopefully gonna go see it on thursday night yeah yeah so we'll talk about that next week and then incredibles because it comes out on the friday it'll have to be the following week but that should work out quite nicely actually for podcast coverage don't want to overdo it <laughs> exactly. Um, so, if we're not going to the cinema, uh, what can we buy on Blu-ray? Only one big release. Again, maybe it's the World Cup, but there's only one big release uh, on disc this week, and that's Red Sparrow, available on uh, both uh, Blu-ray and 4K Blu-ray. Now, I actually saw this last week. Uh, I didn't get a chance to see it at the cinema. Snowed out or snowed snowed in? I was. Yes, we yeah. were. We were snowed yeah. in. Um, and I have to say, I really enjoyed it. It was not what I was expecting at all. And um, it's a lot more violent. I think, actually, interesting, I've got the US disc. I think the UK release was cut to get a 15 certificate, otherwise it would have been an 18. Um, it is a lot more violent than I was expecting, a lot more serious than I was expecting. Jennifer Lawrence is great in it. And uh, overall, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, uh, it was it was a great film. And I, I fortunately didn't do very well, so they won't do more, I suspect, because there are three books in total and I would have quite liked to see them do another one but uh, yeah I, um, I could see where some of the plot points were going and some of the that sort of stuff and it does suffer from the problem of you know a lack of suspects <laughs> you've only got like two or three people it could possibly be there's a mole a Russian mole and you think well it's going to have to be him or him because there's only two people that it could possibly be uh, And uh, but I still enjoyed it I thought it was very well made made by uh, Francis Lawrence I think it is or Lawrence Francis <laughs> uh, who made uh, the uh, last three of the Hunger Games movies with her. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was good. Have you seen it, Kaz? I haven't seen it yet. It's uh, due to land, I think, this weekend. And I'm quite looking forward to it because I've heard kind of mixed things. I was snowed in as well, so it was uh, the same for me. And I'm hoping that whilst you say it was cut, I'm hoping it's one of those kind of John Wick scenarios where the 4K disc is actually secretly uncut because they've done that on a few 4K releases. Well, the, so it's got com- the same certificate but actually it's the uncut version. Yeah, the the uh, Blu-ray is the cut version. I mean, but the 4K releases for all these films appear to be identical. 
Um, so I'm hoping that miraculously it's that. But I, I don't think it's I don't think it's like a huge difference. It's not like the old days when cut meant you're you're practically watching a different film as they yeah, edit yeah. everything. It's normally as with I think John Wick two. It's normally like three seconds out of one scene. And uh, and it's not normally like the action scenes. It's uh, well, there's it's... a couple of nasty torture sequences, which I think maybe where they where they cut and and um, some sexual violence, shall I say, to, uh, directed towards uh, Jennifer Lawrence. So um, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty adult movie. It's it's got a very harsh tone. Um, again, not what I was expecting. You kind of they watch trade, you think, oh, it's a source of Russian spy, you know, um, trying to trick. Uh, westerners you know um with, with honey traps and this sort of stuff but that's kind of partly what it is but but it's a much more serious tone to it and 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 actually quite brutal in places yeah I think a, bit like, maybe... a bit like um what was that film uh american assassin again think... uh that was not what i expected at all but that again was really brutal um and uh with some really nasty torture sequences in it as well uh so it's kind of more like that i think more, a more of a serious take on, on the spy genre think they could have done with maybe better marketing probably for both of them because american assassin uh, i i enjoyed it i enjoyed it a lot for keaton though but it, it was marketed as kind of a young adult yeah and it's not really <laughs> you know and it and it isn't at all i mean no. the the michael keaton scene alone is 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 pretty pretty full on for that kind of film and um and i think they marketed it wrong because because red sparrow definitely looked like a you know catwalk video for jennifer well yeah lawrence. it was aimed at jennifer lawrence's fans and it's so not a teenage girls movie um it's 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 a really hard you know, graphic um brutal realistic spy thriller which is great if, if that's your thing but i i it's not going to appeal to the hunger games i mean I, I i think jennifer lawrence is a strange one because she's she's the highest paid actress in the world um because she's been in two huge franchises. She's been in the Hunger Games franchise, and she's been in the X-Men franchise. But outside of that, her films make no money. <laughs> I mean, Passengers Bombed. I mean, I don't think there's any of her films. I think uh, Silver Lines Playbook did okay, um, partly because of the Oscar buzz. But other than that, and I think also because it came out after Hunger Games, so it was picking up some of that um, that traffic, that, that kind of audience. But the uh, majority of her films don't make money, so I'm really surprised that anyone's prepared to drop 20 million quid on her. <laughs> When, when there's no guarantee you're going to get your money back in the box office. So. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so that's out in Blu-ray this week, and Kaz has been working his way through uh, a pretty big 4K box set this past week. Kaz. So, um, generally, all round, um, how has the Mission Impossible Five disc set stood up to your scrutiny? I think it's been excellent. It's been a real revelation. They've done well to. Um... I mean, given that it, we're talking about a, a period of like 22 years, it done well to bring particularly the first two films up to the kind of standards that make them much easier to watch alongside the later films. Um, they both benefit from 4K remasters, and I think that's where the majority of fans are going to find their enjoyment in the set, is rediscovering uh, Brian De Palma's first one and John Woo's second one, um, which weren't really given fantastic blu-ray releases and which look great on 4k remastered and with the uh, hdr dolby vision the whole works um and I lost do, the soundtracks right lost the soundtracks so everyone's crying out that there's no atmos but i mean we get lost the soundtracks which is which is uh, you know it should should be the norm now but we didn't have a have have them on the old blu-rays so it does make a a difference um i i think it's fantastic it, it, the set isn't universally great. Um, the third movie already looked pretty good on Blu-ray, and it's uh, only a 2K upscale, um, so you don't really notice as much of a dramatic difference in quality. I mean, it is like rediscovering the first two films, but watching the third movie uh, is is a little bit of a letdown after that experience. Um, fourth movie uh, always enjoyed looking pretty special. It's not particularly old now. I think it's like seven years old. So um, that looks. Wasn't some of that shot on IMAX cameras as well? So. Some of it. So it's got variable resolution. Some of it was IMAX. Uh, one day we'll get around to having, you know, those screens full screen. But uh, I get why not everyone likes. Does it the change aspect ratio? Variable. It doesn't. doesn't so like. I think um, I think that maybe I think that maybe it feels like we missed that element of it. Um, but. Uh, but I mean, 
you know, it, it does still look spe- very special. And even the fifth film, which is a uh, 2K upscale like the third one, because it's much more recent, looks pretty spectacular. So it's, um, and I think that's the only one in Atmos out of the whole lot. That was already in Atmos. Um, but the the package is great. They they Of course, they could have done more. They could have done actually one single new extra rather than just porting over the old discs. They could have remastered the old discs because those who want to be sort of future-proofed are essentially rebuying the exact same Blu-rays as before. So that the 4K remasters aren't being used for new Blu-rays. And um, they, they could have done Atmos tracks. And I, I'd have liked a 4K remaster for the third film. Um, but, you know, the, the first two films look excellent. And for those alone, it's worth getting. And who's not going to want the set in 4K just before the new film? It's a great time to revisit it. It's great timing. And um, and it's a, it's a really good purchase. How much was it, Kaz? I think it retails at like a hundred quid from most places, but uh, but a lot of them have dropped it down to seventy, sixty nine ninety nine. Sixty on Amazon, it's sixty nine ninety nine. Well, it, it was it them. was ninety something on Amazon for a long time, but HMV undercut them at sixty nine ninety nine. So Amazon have obviously decided, look, we're not getting any sales this way. So after release, they dropped it to sixty nine ninety nine um, because anyone with any sense wouldn't have paid thirty quid more to go to Amazon. So, so it's it's going for seventy quid for five films in four K, and they're pretty big releases. Paramount, I don't think, are renowned for cheap discs. Their their standard go to price is twenty five quid on release. So I think seventy quid isn't bad for the whole set. Yeah, it's, it seems reasonable if you like those movies and you like all five of them. Then uh, then why not? Um, which one is our mobile phone reviewer? Uh, Dave Feeling in Steve. Yeah, he's in he's in Mission Impossible, the first Mission one. Impossible. He's the guy on the train who finds Tom Cruise's phone and gives it back to him. He's like a, a steward on, on on the Eurostar. So I'm looking forward to seeing a, a, a young David Feeling in uh, in in 4K. <laughs> and then you can go and read his mobile phone reviews on AV forums, right? Uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray releases, Steve. What's coming up? What's been announced? What's been rumored? There's uh, some of this is still not thoroughly confirmed, so a little bit uh, rumor worthy. But uh, I'm pretty sure most of these dates are going to be solid, um, uh, and a lot coming out actually. So first of all, with the release of Infinity War on on 4K disc and Blu-ray in mid-August. Now there's rumors going around that we might even get an extended cut. Of of, um, of Infinity War because uh, there was a lot more Thanos stuff that was cut out of the film because of the length of the running time, but we might get that put back in for a disc release in middle because that would be interesting. Uh, and so obviously to tie in with that release, uh, Marvel are, are prepping the other two Avengers, Avengers movies, Avengers Assemble in this country, and Age of Ultron are also being prepped for a mid August release to tie in with Infinity War. So that's good news. Uh, Deadpool two and actually Deadpool two, Oceans eight, and Bad Boys one and two are all looking like early September releases on 4k disc jurassic world hidden kingdom uh should be in mid-september uh westworld season two and the incredible season two are um are looking like they're going to be mid-november and apparently solo is, is only going to isn't going to come out till october which is strange because you th- you think they want to get it out fast maybe maybe they're going to do a decent grade on it this time uh, I don't know what they're going to do to it. Um, or it's a psychological wait a bit. People f- sort of go, oh, let's give it another chance. Yeah. So you is speed there, it um, out. Is there, is there, there's not a Star Wars film in December. There's nothing coming out in December. So they've right. got nothing out now to December 2019, which is episode nine. So they've got uh, end of July, it's Rebels season four. And I guess they want to give some space for that in August. And then, yeah, I, yeah right. They're probably waiting to think, let's have everything calm down. <laughs> Maybe people will come back to it when they're not in such a bad mood. Uh, I think they're wishful thinking on their part. But uh, I'm sure Solo will do better on home video because I think I think that people are a bit more a bit more relaxed about it then they'll just either watch it on streaming services or um, And and there's you know, people people like us, Steve, that just anything that says Star Wars on it we go and buy. So well, I don't buy it, yeah. Obviously. Oh, I enjoyed it. I'm not I'm looking forward to the release. <laughs> So I, I actually want it, um, which I never thought I'd be saying. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that apparently that October. I, I originally the rumours were August, which would make more sense. But there's quite a lot coming out in August now, so maybe they want to give it some space and not find themselves in the same situation they were at the cinema, where there was too much stuff coming out around it, and that was hurting its box office even more than it already was. So 
the I, I th- I th- yeah, I think the the last film kind of damaged it more than anything else, really. So, well, I've heard rumours that Ryan Johnson's trilogy, the the first one of that's going to be coming out in 2020. So, talk about doubling down on a bad idea. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, we've got it started now. Shall we yeah, just? Anyway, shall we Westworld just like season two? No, no, I'm him off. <laughs> well, well, season two, yeah, and the Incredibles two for mid November. Yeah. Uh, the Incredibles yeah. obviously comes out in July. Um, it's quite soon actually. I think it comes out in a couple of weeks on disc on 4K disc. If you ever want that, obviously it's a time with the cinema release of the film. Uh, so that's that's good news too. Yeah, good stuff. So there's lots of good stuff coming out there. I've just been on uh, to Camelot National Lottery dot com and bought my ticket for tonight. I've been thinking about that house. Uh, and... Swelling my winnings. <laughs> that's not that's not a euphemism. <laughs> You know, don't get me wrong. I'll I'll see that you you know you know, I'll I'll throw something your way for your troubles. But um, you know, it's very nice of you. I think I think the, the odds are better to get hit three times by lightning than, than winning this. You oh no no no! My fa- this right. This is a if you wanted to, to put this into perspective. Now to be clear about this, what I'm about to quote you is um, for the UK lottery with the, a, a far smaller number of entrants than the Euro Millions. If we took the first recognized evidence of modern man Cro-Magnon in circa 15,000 BC and that bloke or woman had proceeded to buy two Euro Millions tickets a week on the Wednesdays and the Fridays draw between 15,000 BC and the present they're still sorry national lottery tickets not Euro Millions they're still four to five thousand years away from winning the jackpot if you um, wanted something profoundly depressing to chew on. That, that's uh, if they pick the same numbers every week and not a lucky dip, though. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's been calculated, <laughs> if, if it works on the same... same. But um, it, Seemingly, the odds are exactly the same, Ed. Whether, yeah, whether so you put the same I, I always, numbers on or you get a lucky I dip. I always do um, lucky dip because there's the psychological uh, minefield of your, your, in inverted commas, numbers coming up on the time you didn't buy a ticket, which is completely obviated if you always go for lucky debt because it's like, well, there might be my numbers, but the mach- I, you know, I didn't, I didn't ask the machine to fart them out. So that, that is, I, I just for psychological well being, I go with that. So, uh, yeah. I'd, I've just been to book, book my ticket for Skyscraper as well, Steve. There's already, they've already sold nine tickets for that screening. I think, yeah, it, I think it's going to be a huge hit, I think. Nine tickets. It will do well. It will do well. Yeah, I couldn't get my regular seat. Annoyed. Some bastards has taken it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the listen, the Rocks, you know, he, he, he doesn't tend to have too many failures. I mean, Baywatch didn't do very well last year. Uh, I think as Tony it probably missed it slightly, which is unusual for him. But uh, Rampage did well this year. Um yeah, he, generally his films make money, uh, and I'm sure that Skyscraper, when you consider how it's being pitched, advertised, the concept, I think uh, I think that will do well. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, uh, a relatively entertaining thing. I haven't made it out to see Super Troopers 2, and I dare say that that's already disappeared. I, I, of, uh, yeah, I think it's gone. I didn't see it listed there, Ed, so I think uh, it's already so. had its already had its run. You, you can get on disc, though. Uh, I don't have a disc player, but yeah, nice, nice idea. <laughs> but, um, Stream it. <laughs> I will have to wait until it appears on streaming, which it almost certainly will um, at some point. Okay. So, yes. But anyway, talking about The Rock and his skyscraper, Steve's asked the question in the running order, what's the best movies involving a skyscraper or tower lock? Well, the only one I can think of is Tower of Inferno. <laughs> well, there are two obvious ones, aren't there? And basically that's what skyscraper is, an amalgamation of the two obvious ones, The Towering Inferno and Die Hard, which is fair enough. The best disaster movie ever made. Towering Inferno, the best action film ever made. Best, hang, on, hard. hang on, the best Christmas action movie ever made. Yeah, yeah. so the best Christmas movie as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, both of those obviously, the the, the, the plot centres around the fact they take place in tall buildings. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, there's quite a few films where tall buildings play a key role. So thinking about the Mission Impossible films, there's a whole sequence at the Burj Khalifa, which is a fantastic sequence that you yeah, know, that, relies on them torturous. being in... They do, <laughs> they they get go, they do go other places. <laughs> well, I, I was watching the latest trailer for Skyscraper and uh, that it's not going to do my vertical any good whatsoever. I doubt it. <laughs> what's They're going to see it in 3D. Yeah. Uh, so, well, okay, so but these are my, my suggestions. Obviously, Tarry and Ferdo, uh for disaster movies, for action films, um, you've got uh, Die Hard. 
a sort of, sort of incidental within a film. It's not that the entire film isn't built around being in a, in, a, in a tall building, but there are key sequences in, well, for as I mentioned, Mission Impossible: um, uh, Ghost Protocol, and uh, which was the which was the, the Fast and the Furious movie where they drove a car between two skyscrapers. Six. No, yeah, no, seven. Yeah, I think seven. It... Yeah, the last one with Paul Walker in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the seventh one where they drive between two skyscrapers. So that was quite good. Um, and if, if you want, if you don't, if you get vertigo, uh, then I don't recommend this. But certainly for skyscraper action, The Walk makes oh, great yeah. use of the yeah. world. No, that films. is actually yeah. a cracking film. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, but Steve, I'm afraid you've been unimaginative here. You've missed two films where actually the the, the toweriness of the thing is 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 um, sort of integral to the film. The first is the uh, underrated British effort attack the block i would that was on my list as well yeah i really enjoyed that and it, it makes good use of the nature of crap 60s tower blocks in the in in its construction and, and the other one boyoga as well uh, that's well. true enough and also um dread mm-hmm. now that's cracking use of a very tall building especially that sequence at the end in super slow-mo with uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really quite something um, and, and by virtue of dread, I could also you can also mention the raid, which yes. again takes place in a tall building. This is true. Uh, so yeah, I mean there are some some options there. I mean yeah. I do love the towering inferno. It's bloody marvellous. Well the trade centre. Uh, well, they don't actually get up the tall. Yeah, on the under, under it, it just falls on <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it still features it, even though they're lying under it. Well, well, it's a tough one, isn't it? You've mentioned all of the good ones. Um, I, there's a, a Brit film Tower Block, which uh, which incorporates kind of the notion of the claustrophobia of being locked up there and shot at by a sniper. I got one. High rise. Uh, yes, yeah, high rise. But I think I think I mean it doesn't. It, it, the the concept of it is is as you already mentioned. It was defined by like Towering Inferno, and then you know made into something new by Die Hard. Um, and I, I don't think that um, I think they they the films generally these days they tend to port the idea of the person and the setup rather than the location. So like Die Hard had it had it in the ta- tower in the beginning, but actually all the other films are essentially Die Hard in a something, and that became the motif for a whole series of films afterwards, didn't it? You'd have the die-hard concept on a boat, on a train, on a bus. Um, so I, I think, I think once they've done the tower block, I'm not really sure they go back to it that often, do they? Well, we've mentioned half a dozen films. We could maybe eke it up to a dozen films, um, but it, it makes me wonder whether something like Skyscraper will will hit a bit of a niche. You know, for all of the throwbacks to Die Hard, I've seen the poster. It's basically a riff on Die Hard. Um, but it maybe is something of a niche, which hasn't really been fully explored. I, I think uh, I think what we've hit on here is is the fact that skyscrapers and tall buildings in general are severely under underrepresented in Hollywood. And <laughs> more <laughs> films involving skyscrapers. That's what we need. I just think it was Steve hurriedly writing a um, hurriedly writing a, uh, a a schedule for this podcast and work out if he could shoehorn more rock into it. That's exactly <laughs> what it was. That's exactly. Um, yeah, was, you, know. you there too, were you, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I like, I like the. I have a lot of time for the Rock. Uh, he is one of the hardest working people I know, and as you say, he generally has quite consistently impressive box office pull. But I don't think I have the same feelings that Steve does um, for him. Uh, I, I don't know if any of us do. I'm not even sure that The Rock's wife or girlfriend has the same <laughs> feelings for The Rock as that Steve does. So um, it's all good. It, it I would love to get a photo of the two of them together, though, because just the look of childlike wonder on Steve's face. He was next to this giant man. It would, <laughs> it would be perfect. Man crash <laughs> overload. We, uh, I, I, had a, I had a friend who, who was a massive, massive fan. I'm, I mean massive fan of Chuck Norris. And when he got married, we were quite close to getting Chuck Norris to be his best man. <laughs> How much did uh, that set you back? Well, basically, Chuck was up for it. Uh, we had to basically fly him first class to Hong Kong um, uh, uh, and put him up in a no, like Mandarin Oriental or something like that, somewhere nice. And, and But he, he he was up for the concept of flying over to Hong Kong to be best man for this guy's wedding and then fly back. 
Whereas got... with, with Tom Hanks and your wedding, it appears that if you just like say his name That's three right. times in the mirror, he just like rocks up and starts making <laughs> himself in wedding photos. So... Oh, there was a brilliant one on, on screen, screen Junkies where The Rock married the, one of his one of the guys on Screen Junkies was a big fan of The Rock. Um, but yeah, he basically The Rock became uh, he, he registered as a as a, as a uh, you know for with a religion somewhere to, to be able to, uh, to you know not adjudicate. Um, what's the word when you do a wedding? <laughs> he was the um... Uh, well, he was doing the role of the, the registrar. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was registered so he could do that, and he actually married this guy. Um, and it was a big surprise, and that was actually really funny. So, and he, and he managed to throw in some promotions for his film at the same time as doing the wedding. <laughs> Genius. So there you go. So yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> who would who would have seen us start with the weather and end with wedding advice? We um we cover all bases randomly, uselessly, and generally speaking with little understanding of what we're doing but th- this podcast really it, it goes places that other technology podcasts <laughs> cannot reach yep just switch the microphones on and and you never know what you're gonna get <laughs> <Hope for> the best <laughs> that's it most weeks isn't it i mean it's i don't know why we do a running order we never seem to stick to it but there we go um it's that's it for another week we're done we're over we're spent my thanks to steve withers slide dog you've got me monologuing ed selly spoiled stupid little stick figures with poofy lips who think only about themselves and Kaz Hallow who wants the pressure of being super all the time don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews news and videos and of course leave us a 5 star rating on iTunes but only if you enjoyed the show I'm Phil Hinton thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again next week (laughs) 